Uh, it's good to see so many of you this morning. Uh, my name is TK, for those that I haven't met or who don't know who I am, and uh, I'm involved mostly with the Young Adults group here and production team at the back. So it's an honor and privilege to be able to bring the word this morning. It's, it's been a great service so far. I feel uh, unworthy to be here and just wanted to keep it going, but it's, it's great to see all the baptisms and, and communion and have a great time of worship. Um, and I think it was it's really special. Uh, and of course, it's Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all the dads and father figures out there. Uh, I know some of you probably have plans straight after, so I will try to honor your time and not keep you hostage for too long, uh, or at least in time for, for lunch. So, um, The topic that I've chosen to speak on this morning is, where does your help come from? Uh, and that's, um, I guess, an, an obvious question, or a question with an obvious answer, but we'll explore that in a little bit. Uh, but I want to ask you, how many of you love a good road trip? So, a few of us? Yeah, OK, I thought it was just a young person thing, but that's good. Uh, I, love a, I love a road trip. I love driving around. And um, I think they're fun, right? Uh, and I've, I've heard when you have kids, uh, it changes a little bit. You know, most of your road trips are, are probably trying to keep the siblings in the backseat alive and stopping them from killing each other. And, and you're probably constantly answering the question, you know, are we there yet? Or something like that. But whatever your road trip situation is like, I think it's important to have music, right? Uh, a playlist for me is, is key uh, for, for, for a road trip. Uh, and Sim, my wife, and I have an ongoing debate at the moment about who is meant to select the music for the road trip. Is it the driver or the passenger at the front? Now, I'm not going to tell you what I think, because I'm sure half of you are going to stop listening to me after you hear my answer. So maybe I'll tell you at the end, or you can ask me after. But please pray for us, because we need to settle that debate soon. Uh, but Music is, is important, I think, uh, on, on your road trip. Uh, and in scripture, you, there is a road trip playlist, so to speak, that is found um, in a section of the Psalms called the Psalms of the Songs of Ascents. Uh, and scholars believe, so you find them uh, in Psalm 120 to 134. And scholars believe that these were sung by pilgrims journeying up Mount Zion uh, through the gates of Jerusalem up to the temples to to worship and celebrate different fest feasts such as Passover, uh, Pentecost, and different tabernacles. Uh, and so these psalms are like a road trip playlist, so to speak. Uh, and we're, we're going to sort of focus on just one of the songs, otherwise we'll be here all week. Um, and whilst these pilgrims were going to a good place, where they were going was something uh, it was good, there was something, it was something they were looking forward to, the journey itself was not easy. Uh, it was through dangerous territory with potentially unforgiving weather uh, and some dodgy characters on the way. And one of the questions that they were faced with uh, on their journey is, where does our help come from? And so as they looked towards this journey uh, and, and they looked forward to it, they would be very much aware of the dangers that are uh, before them. And so, where does that help come from? And Psalm 121 explores that, that question, and we, we, I'm sure many of us know it very well. And uh, now, we're probably not on a journey to Jerusalem, uh, like the pilgrims were, but we're all on a journey uh, of life. And so this question, I think, is important for us to, to consider, uh, or more so, what does the answer mean to us? Because I'm pretty sure if I ask you what the answer is, you, you, you get it correctly. Uh, so I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll, we'll look at the psalm. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for what you're doing already in the service. We pray that our ears will be open to hear what you want to say to us, and that uh, we'll put it into practice, and it will uh, stay in our hearts and change us the way you want to change us. Be with us this morning. We know you're already here. We pray that uh, there won't be any distractions, and that the words I speak are not merely my words, but are from you, Lord. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so I'll, I'll say through this. I'll, it's pretty short. Hopefully you can read that. So the first one, the first couple of verses, uh, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Answer is pretty obvious. Our help comes from Yahweh. Our help comes from God. Done, right? We can pretty much head out to celebrations for Father's Day. Giving you the answer. Sermon, well done. We're done here. Um, but I just want to touch quickly on, on uh, that first line, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. There's different ways scholars sort of, I guess, interpret the mountains or different people interpret mountains. Some interpret them as uh, I guess, reference to the dangerous path that they were on, and these mountains are seen as, as a challenge, right? A challenge that the pilgrims uh, have to face on their way to Jerusalem. Others interpret the mountains as referring to where the false gods were worshipped, because uh, you, uh, you think of first kings, and we'll look at it in a little bit, when Baal, Baal was worshipped and other false gods, they would do that on mountains, so uh, some people interpret that as a reference to the psalmist looking at the mountains and thinking about all the false gods that are worshipped there. Uh, and others interpret it as Mount Zion, where they are looking forward to, to being, right? So if I'm traveling somewhere, you know, I look forward to that trip, so I, you know, I lift up my eyes to, to in a positive, um, I guess, feeling towards the destination. Um, now, whether you see the mountains as, a, as something to, to dread or a false god or something to look forward to with desire, I think the emphasis here is that our help comes from Yahweh. Right? Our help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. He is the one who created the whole world with his, with his word. He is the one who created the mountains that we lift up our eyes to. Uh, and so, though the journey might be filled with many perils and, and dangers, we know where our help comes from. Right? And Psalm 121 is, is quite short. It's only eight verses long and seems obvious and simple. Uh, and, and it starts off with that question of where does the help come from, and then the rest of the psalm is pretty much just a rehashing of the answer of our help comes from Yahweh. Uh, but I think what it shows us is that Yahweh is not a God who just made the world and then took a step back and said, all right, let's see what you earthlings will get up to. Uh, but he's actually involved in this world right now. He is with us. And so... The rest of the psalm is expanding on God's involvement uh, in the world and uh, in, with God's people. And so the next thing that we see from verses 3 to 4 uh, is that he watches over his people. Uh, we can look to Yahweh for help because he cares for his people. He watches over his people. So he says, he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, who watch, he who watches over Israel will neither sleep, slumber nor sleep. Now, it might seem pretty obvious, or at least to me, I'm like, God made the world. Why does he need sleep? Right? Why mention that he doesn't sleep or slumber? That's pretty obvious for a God. But back in the day, uh, in, in ancient Near Eastern, Near Eastern religions, uh, it was normal for gods to sleep. Well, they believed God slept. Right? They, they, they thought gods needed to you know, take a break from uh, the people uh, in their God duties, so to speak. Uh, and so this is a contrast on Yahweh and the gods that other nations believed. And if you cast your minds back to 1 Kings 18, when Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal to prove who the real God was you know, in that trial uh, by fire, you remember how one of the ways that he taunts the prophets of Baal is by shouting, you know, telling them to shout louder because Maybe their the gods were asleep, and they do it, right? So if you read, I'll read for you there. Uh, 1 Kings 18, uh, 26 to 29, it says, Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought. Yeah or busy, or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. 
So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. A midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Unlike Baal and other gods, Yahweh doesn't need to sleep. Right? He doesn't need to take a toilet break or take time out. He doesn't need a break from us. It's the opposite, actually. He is always attentive to our needs, and he watches over us, and he desires to be with us. And he doesn't just passively watch over us. You know, it's not like he's folding his arms and going, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. The word uh, translated watches over there or keep in some translations uh, could mean protect or guard. So it's kind of like guards at a castle or even security guards uh, in, in our modern day. Uh, as they're patrolling, they are watching over the place they're patrolling. But it's not just a passive observation. They are ready to pounce on any threat that is coming uh, their way. And so that's how God uh, treats us. He is there watching over us, protecting us, and keeping his watchful eye on his people so that not even a foot of his people will slip from the path. And therefore, we shouldn't be afraid of any threats that come our way because we know Yahweh, who created the world, is watching over us. Uh, and then that theme of protection continues on uh, in verses 5 to 8. Uh, and the, uh, it reads, The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going now and forevermore. All right, so the psalmist is using uh, imagery of uh, God being a shade. We understand shade, you know, in a hot sun, you go under the shade, for it provides uh, much welcome cooling. Uh, and, but why the right hand? Right? It seems a bit odd, but if you think of the armies at the time, uh, a soldier would carry the shield in their left hand and a sword in their right hand. But that meant their right hand was exposed or vulnerable. So they would have a right-hand man, so to speak, who would cover them so that that right side is also protected uh, with, with a shield. So it's sort of similar to that. While this psalm is not talking about going to war, uh, the image evoked is of God being like the soldier or friend who fights off the threats that are trying to exploit your weaknesses. And we know uh, the enemy is always trying to, uh, to attack us and, and exploit, uh, I guess, our weaker side. Uh, but God is there to protect us, uh, and he's, he's with us. And so whether it's during the day, uh, in the scorching sun, or at night, uh, in the cold, probably, God is protecting his people all the time. He's constantly there. Like I said, he doesn't need to take a break. And so you can see in that psalm from verses 1 to 8, you can sense the confidence that, you know, as they gear up for this journey, as they on this road trip, uh, it's on foot, by the way, uh, they're reminding themselves of the God who they serve. He cares for them, and he will protect them. But he is with them on their journey. Uh, and so just like God was with the pilgrims on their journey and all of God's people in Scripture, as we see, uh, he is with us on our journey of life. And it's life that is filled with many disappointments or betrayal, sickness, death of loved ones, broken dreams, loneliness. God is with us. So through the psalm that we just read and other parts of Scripture, we are reminded that God cares for us. Uh, he is a powerful God who created the world, uh, and He protects us and is with us, and He loves us. Uh, he demonstrated His love through Jesus, through the cross, and we reflected on that uh, during communion, so probably don't need to labor much on, on that. Uh, but whilst we are in our natural states, sometimes we are tempted to run to other things for help, right? Uh, yet God sent Jesus in his great uh, act of love and mercy to save us from that grip of false gods. Uh, we might not be worshipping bowels uh, or idols, but sometimes our finances, our possessions, our own strength or our own selves tend to become our gods. 
and Jesus came down to save us even from those things. Because all those things, though they may be good gifts, are inadequate to actually help us in this journey of life. And they can't save us from uh, our own sin or even protect us from the evil one. But God has proven his love and care for his people through sending Jesus. And he has proven his power and victory through Jesus' resurrection. But he didn't stay dead, he actually resurrected and he lives with us today by the Spirit. So because we are God's children through what Jesus has done, uh, the truth of Psalm 121 applies to us. Right? We too are reminded and we are confident of the truth that Yahweh, the keeper, the helper, the protector of Israel, is our God and he cares for us and he is for us and he protects us and he is with us. The God who created this world, the almighty God, he's also your redeemer and he's your friend. He walks with us. So if we quickly look at the structure of Psalm 121 again, excuse my artistic drawings over there. Um, it's, it's fairly simple, like I mentioned, right? It starts off with a question in verse 1 and the answer in verse 2, which is fairly obvious for those of us at least who've grown up in church. Uh, and then verses 3 to 8 are an expansion of what the answer uh, given in verse 2 is. I mean, it looks at those actions of, of who God is and what he does pertaining to his people. You know, he will not let your foot slip. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. He watches over you and he will keep you from all harm. And so obviously, the obvious implication is we shouldn't be afraid because we know who God is and what he does. And because of our understanding of who God is and what he does, we don't need to fear. Uh, and in highlighting God's characteristics and, the, and in Psalm 121, the author of that psalm is actually bringing out the heart uh, of, the, of the road trip song, right? And reminding themselves of who God is, uh, they're doing theology, so to speak. Uh, and that's why it's important for us to to make sure we have a solid understanding of who God is and we have a solid theology. Because a good understanding of who God is and what he is done, what he has done as revealed in Scripture and in, in Jesus uh, will help us uh, in our walk, uh, in our journey of life. So I want to make three quick points before we conclude uh, on this. And, and that is, theology should lead to doxology. Theology should, theology should impact our beliefs and it should impact our actions. I don't want to explain what doxology is. Uh, and so the first one, theology should lead to doxology, is pretty much just saying theology should lead us to worship. Right? Knowledge of God should affect our worship. Right? And, and it's, it's interesting how if we choose to keep you know, theology purely as a knowledge exercise and it stays in our minds, uh, it's actually pointless. I think Christos mentioned it last week, that the devil is a better theologian than all of us. And I think he's right in the sense that he knows Scripture probably better than everyone here. And what does he do with it? He twists it and he corrupts it to entice humans away from God. And he doesn't praise God. So we shouldn't just make theology an intellectual exercise. Uh, and not let it impact our hearts and actions. It should actually lead us to worshiping God. Otherwise, we miss the point. Right? And worshiping God isn't just about music, and we, we did, did that this morning. It was beautiful. So sing songs to God. But it's in our daily life. Right? Worship is a, is a lifelong thing. It's, it's the way you work. So knowledge of God should impact how you approach your, your work should impact how you approach your studies. It should impact how you approach different relationships. That is worship. The next point is theology should impact our beliefs. That's fairly obvious, but um, as we study scripture and, and do that with a desire to know God, we experience transformation of the mind. Right? And it's a transformation on who God is and the situation that we face. Uh, Romans 12 Verse 1 to 2, I'll just read from uh, verse 2, a uh, fairly, fairly common passage. Uh, it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. B 
be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, we all have a worldview, right? A worldview is simply a story about this world, what we believe about this world, our purpose and how we should live. Uh, when we form this through different experiences, through different uh, studies, different stories that we tell one another about the world, um, and studying scripture and communing with God helps shape our worldview, right? It shapes the, um, that story to be in line with the real story of the world. Because God created the world, right? So he has the best view of the world. He has the best worldview. And so if we want to, uh, to have the best worldview, we need to align our beliefs with what he says. And that happens as we study scripture more and as we spend more time with him. And so as we grow in our knowledge of God and our walk with him, we should actually choose to believe the truth that he says in order for it to impact our worldview about who we are, who God is. Uh, and it not only impacts our view of God and others, it impacts our view of the situations that we may face. Right? How we approach challenging situations and life choices is really reliant on our worldview. And we having a Christian worldview will help us steer away from false beliefs uh, about God, about ourselves, or the situations that we are in. Last point on that one is theology should impact our behavior, our actions, right? Fairly straightforward. First John uh, 3 and verse 18 it says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And then in 23 and 24 it says, and this is his command, to believe in the name of, Je of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. So we, theology should impact our behavioral actions, and we do this by living by the power of the spirit. In the Great Commission, uh, that we all know, Jesus promised that he is always with us to the ends of the earth, world. And that is through God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is with us right now. And so he helps us live in obedience. Uh, and knowing God's heart and desire through the, his word will help us live by the power of the Spirit. But we need to rely on the Holy Spirit. Uh, and sometimes it's unfortunate that power of the Spirit and the Word of God are sort of pinned against each other, but you can't do one without the other. It's both ends. So, coming into close, uh, and our focus today obviously has been Psalm 121, which starts off by posing that question, where does uh, our help come from? So, I want to ask you that question. Where does your help come from? Or rather, more importantly, where do you seek your help from? Because we know our help comes from the Lord, but do we actually seek it from Him? Uh, we read, uh, Maria read Hebrews uh, so towards the end of communion, and I actually want to close off by, by reading the same passage she read. It's a great alignment over there. Uh, and so if the band wants to start coming up, because I'm, I'm closing now. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, from verse 12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him whom we must give account. Nothing is hidden from God. Everything is laid bare before him, the ultimate judge. And maybe as you hear this, I don't know what feelings are evoked. Uh, it could be guilt because you know what's inside. It's like, oh, the things that I try to hide from everyone, God sees that. Or maybe it's... Uh, uh, I guess you know you haven't been a good parent, or a good friend, a good sibling. 
Maybe you don't just feel it, but you know that you, you, you haven't been a good person. Or, or maybe on the flip side, you face so much injustice and you carry so much pain that you've, uh, you've been bearing it on your own and wondering if God cares or if he even sees. Well, I'm here to remind you through this passage that nothing is hidden from God's sight. He sees you. Right. Wherever we fit in those categories, the passage doesn't end there. It continues on saying, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us, with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus, you know, who was fully God, fully man, he faced all the temptations that we face, and he knows what it's like to be tempted. Yet he carried all our sin and shame and injustices, and he nailed them to the cross, and he defeated them. And I love how this chapter ends in verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is no confidence in our own ability, but confidence in God who he is, his character, and his ability. And he has proven his love and his care for us through the cross, and he invites us to come boldly to his throne of grace where we find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. So if there's anything you take away from, from what I was just saying in the last uh, half an hour or so, that Jesus is our great help. Not our money, not our possessions, not our careers, but Jesus. And so as you head into the week, may you be reminded of that, that Jesus is your help. May you remember that your help comes from him, the maker of heaven and earth. And he is there to help you. He invites you to come to his throne of grace with confidence, with boldness. Not because you've earned it or deserve it, but because he is merciful and gracious is true to his word, and he loves you. That's how good our God is.